At an inquiry headed by Lord Mersey, vital questions were asked one by one. I understand the Titanic was engaged in a race to beat the speed record across the Atlantic. Is this true? She was not, as some people surmise, trying to break the speed record for the North Atlantic. She was not that fast. The Titanic received at least four warnings of icebergs in the area. Why did she ignore them? The fourth and most dramatic warning came about dinner time. This was of icebergs and growler ice right in the path that she was taken. Now, there's uh, a lot of doubt whether this ever got to the bridge. At the time, the Titanic's radio officer was sending personal messages to the shore from, from the passengers, expecting to get ashore the following day, etc. And probably this message, this vital message, never got to the bridge. Everyone thought the Titanic was unsinkable. Why then did she sink? No marine architect would say such a ship is unsinkable. However, by the standards of design at the time, it was the best designed ship in terms of compartmentation and floatability. Knowing there was ice in the area, why did Captain Smith not slow down or even stop like other liners in the area? Quite simply because it was the custom of the White Star and most of the other crack transatlantic liners to get their passengers to the other side without stopping if they could avoid it. They did so because they knew that with a good lookout they could see icebergs and unless the visibility was bad they didn't stop. So the Titanic didn't stop and it is only with hindsight that you might ask why did she not stop or slow down. How carefully did the crew look for icebergs? Can they be charged with carelessness or negligence? In those days there was no such thing as radar. Uh, the only procedure was extra lookouts. For example, in the forward lookout, two lookout men were set. All precautions that could be taken, apart from stopping the ship, were in fact taken. The lights on the foredeck were dimmed so they wouldn't dazzle the lookouts. Uh, the lookouts were warned to look out for ice. Every witness agrees that with enough lifeboats, every single person on the Titanic could have been saved. Why then were there so few lifeboats? The Board of Trade, which governed the um, life-saving accommodation on British ships in those days, believed that if she had enough watertight compartments, they needn't have enough lifeboats, needn't have more lifeboats than a certain minimum number. So, was no one to blame? With 1,503 people drowned, the inquiry had to come up with an explanation. The judgment was that a nearby ship, the Californian, had failed to come to the rescue quickly enough. Her captain, Stanley Lord, was censured. But ever since, there has been a fight to clear his name. Mystery still surrounds the part that the Californian played. Her radio operator, it is said, was asleep at the time. Her logbook shows she was stationary among the icebergs. Captain Lord was inexperienced in such conditions. But could she have seen the distress signals from the Titanic and failed to answer them? This was the crime for which Captain Lord was pronounced guilty. As the survivors bobbed about in their lifeboats waiting to be rescued, undoubtedly a ship of some sort approached. I saw a ship which seemed to me to be quite close by, close enough to see all her ports and the lights on her deck and definitely not moving. And it seemed so close. And I can remember crying for a long time and saying, why doesn't that ship come to us? It wasn't big compared with the Titanic because she was very big. But certainly it was a ship and the outline of the ship and all the lights on it. Not just some lights on the horizon. But was this ship the Californian? Peter Padfield, having examined the evidence from both the British and American inquiries into the disaster, thinks Captain Lord was made a scapegoat. To my mind, the evidence is conclusive. It could not have been Captain Lord because when the Titanic sank, none of the lookouts or the officers on the watch of the Titanic could see any ships in the vicinity. Subsequently, while they were getting the boats down, a, a ship did appear came towards the Titanic until she was as close as five miles and you could see her side lights. And then she turned and went away again. The evidence is conclusive that the Californian was stopped during the whole night. 
and therefore that single fact, apart from many others, convinces me that it couldn't possibly have been the captain of the Californian. The dispute is basically about the relative position of the two ships. According to the inquiry, the Californian was no more than five miles away and should easily have seen the distress signals. But in the confusion that followed the collision with the iceberg, did the Titanic signals officer make a mistake? He worked out a position by dead reckoning, based on a star sighting six hours before. He did not allow for drift. The currents in that part of the North Atlantic are powerful. Allowing for drift, it's possible that the Titanic and the Californian would have been separated by at least 20 miles, and the distress signals impossible to see. The matter could be settled once and for all if a search expedition could pinpoint the actual position of the Titanic. So far, this has not happened, as the chief scientist of the 1981 vessel admitted. The, the one interesting thing is where the Titanic, this is where the Titanic hit the iceberg, okay? The current was drifting in this direction, and here is where they picked up the survivors hours later. You can see we have quite a few anomalies in that particular area. The scientists uh, can't tell for sure if it's a man-made object or geological. There is considerable doubt about whether the Titanic is still intact. Charles Haas of the Titanic Historical Society explains the possibilities. Many survivors' accounts report that there was a loud, roaring, rumbling noise as if everything in the ship had broken loose and had crashed down to the bow. In fact, this was probably the ship's boilers. There were 29 of them, and each one weighed 90 tons, plus the ship's engines weighing hundreds of tons. And all of this tremendous weight plummeted down towards the bow, crashing and smashing its way through everything until it probably exited right through the bow of the ship. Once the ship re achieved an equilibrium, it then settled back slightly and plunged downward underwater. Now, there are two theories as to what became of the ship. The first was that she continued in a nose-down position until she finally hit the bottom, striking somewhere at a speed of 30 to 50 miles an hour. The other theory said that the Titanic sank like a leaf in that she moved back and forth through the water and suffered less damage when she finally hit the bottom. It is on record that a number of passengers canceled their reservations, seemingly foreseeing disaster. It was an extraordinary coincidence that she should sink on her maiden voyage and that she should strike an iceberg below the waterline in the only way that made her vulnerable. Eva Hart's story of her mother's premonition of disaster is just one of many similar tales. My father made up his mind to cut his losses here and to go to Canada. Well, he booked a first-class passage for us in the ship called Philadelphia. Now, from the very moment that this had been decided, my mother had an extraordinary premonition, something she'd never had in her life before, never had again. Then came the day I heard my father say to her very crossly, and I wouldn't mind quite so much if you told me what it is you're so frightened of. And she said, I couldn't tell you, I don't know. But I know it's a fatal thing for us to do, we just mustn't go. And then came the news that we couldn't sail in the Philadelphia because there was a dock strike. And I really think my mother thought that was more or less a reprieve, but not my father. And one day, to his immense joy, we were told that if we paid some extra money, we could go second class in the Titanic. Largest ship in the world. And then and only then did my mother say, well, now I know why I'm frightened. And he said, why are you frightened? And she said, because they say this ship is unsinkable and that is flying in the face of God. We will never get there. And she was so right. And never again in her life did she have a premonition. But to that premonition, I owe my life. Because my mother never went to bed in that ship. She slept in the daytime and sat up at night. The story of the Titanic is one that raises more questions than it answers. Where exactly was she lost? Will we ever find out? What was the mystery ship that sailed so close to her in the night? A radio operator asleep. 
an ice warning that never reached the bridge, a collision that struck where the Titanic was most vulnerable. Could this set of circumstances be entirely accident? As a result of the Titanic tragedy, the United States Coast Guard runs an international ice patrol, and all transatlantic liners use a more southerly route. Perhaps it's a small consolation for the relatives of the 1,503 people who died on that cold April night. Coming up next, In Search Of continues with a probe into the claim that the sinking of the Lusitania was part of a plot to engage the U.S. in World War I. Then 20th Century with Mike Wallace reports on child abuse scandals. And later tonight, Haydn's head and Liberace's piano turn up along with Charlie Chaplin's shoes.